Maria Olchan, Chief Executive Officer and President of the company, and Amanda Lombard, Chief Financial Officer. I will start the discussion today, but feel free to use the chat box below to participate. Uh, I want to begin, though, uh, with first asking Andrea, what is the opportunity set for investors of the company? Thank you so much, Wes, and bear with me. I'm, uh, I'm having a voice. So, um, listen, I was on the other side of this company during the interview process, trying to understand the value and understand what Heritage was and, and what their uh, value creation methodology was, and it was very difficult. And I think that the lessons that that taught me about um, really trying to express the value, because once I came in and I saw the incredible opportunities um, in making these former Sears boxes into um, whether it's life sciences or grocery anchorage trips or uh, the triple net opportunities, as, as you may know, our average site is 13 acres. And so we have already 50 triple net opportunities um, right, that are happening or, or already uh, executed and probably the same amount in the pipeline. So when you think about things like that, um, you start to understand the value. And so um, the first thing I did is I went through the portfolio with the team asset by asset, and we looked at the market, we looked at um, the leasing, we looked at um, the opportunity really, truly with fresh eyes. And what that um, did is it sort of laid out that there were sort of six main um, business plans, if you will, for the, for the, for the portfolio. Um, one is multi-tenant retail, right? That's obvious. Um, a lot of those are a factor of uh, Sears downsized before they vacated in a lot of really prime retail locations and we leased around them. So it's really a play of leasing off the rest of that box uh, once Sears vacated. Um, but the fact that Sears downsized in those locations and didn't reject those leases demonstrates the value of the retail location. Now, when we looked at those locations, as I said, we have 13 acres. We also said, okay, how can we densify, right? What is, you know, if you have 13 acres of land, on average, often much more, um, Sears tends to be, by the way, in the best position in the mall uh, because of the auto center and they wanted that exposure on the main, on the main roads. So we often have the, the best position. So we looked at, can we densify in terms of the auto center? Can we add triple net uh, parcels? Um, is there a residential or office built to suit opportunity? So looking at that, um, and then this, sort of the second bucket was grocery, because as you know, um, there's a tremendous uh, demand for grocery anchor strips, um, and a lot of our locations uh, really are incredibly uh, well located in terms of demographics, and they command uh, that sort of tenants. Um, so there is multi-tenant retail, grocery anchor trips, the triple net portfolio, which I talked about. Then separately, there are office and life sciences opportunities for places like, you know, Southern San Francisco. Um, or um, UTC, La Jolla, uh, phenomenal life sciences opportunities there. Um, and they're also, you know, Redmond is a market that has a lot of office. Um, and we looked at it both, you know, for office and residential. And that's, that's a, a bigger site that has probably a lot of identification opportunities. Um, and then we said, what do we no longer want to own? Right. So we have all these incredible investment opportunities. Where should we be putting our capital? What's the best use of our capital? And there were some more marginal uh, locations and we wanted to be proactive about, about dispositions. I think historically it's been very confusing to the market. Personally, as someone who was trying to understand the company from the outside uh, quite recently, I didn't really understand the disposition strategy. And I don't really think there was one. I think it was more liquidity driven. And I think that, you know, as you can sort of hear from how I do everything, I'm incredibly um, methodical, I'm analytical. And so, you know, I wanted to make sure that we are focusing our teams on execution, inclusive of selling the things that we don't think are worth owning in our portfolio. That doesn't mean they're not, they're not valuable. They just don't fit in these, in these six buckets, which we think uh, are the ways to create value. The other thing is, um, as you will know, that these six buckets um, translate directly into how you can capitalize this real estate. So, um, you know, as everyone knows, uh, here, the private markets have been incredibly flush with capital in the last in the last few years, um, and they need to put this money out. Debt is incredibly cheap. Uh, however, the the sources of debt and equity in the private markets are incredibly narrow, and they have very 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 tight mandates as to what they should be uh, or can be investing in uh, with their institutional backers. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to just be a very obvious fit, right? Um, you know, we don't want to be in anyone's you know too difficult pile. Uh, you know, if you, we, we wanted, you know, easy to understand portfolios um, that we can really take advantage of uh, the discrepancy between where the portfolio should be financed 
from a cost of capital perspective and where the enterprise is being financed as a cost of capital perspective. Um, you know, we have obviously, we have a terrific loan with Berkshire Hathaway in the sense that they've been unbelievable partners with us, um, super supportive of our sales program, totally get the value creation opportunity um, and, and really uh, believe in the believe in the leadership of the company, um, you know, personal relationships up and down the line, whether, you know, some time with, with Warren or Charlie uh, or a G, they've all been fantastic and all the way down the line. Um, that being said, it's very expensive money. Um, and you know that that isn't lost on us. Our preferreds are seven percent as well. So um, you know, and for debt for multifamily, it's sometimes is, is right now sub fours. Um, premier retail is is going off in the three and a half range. Um, so e even if your bogey is called four percent, uh, you know, three hundred bits of of, uh, of value there um, in terms of lowering your cost of capital is massive. And I think people you know talk talk a lot and ask us a lot about the cost of capital. And I, I think that if anything, they should be seeing it as an opportunity. Um, the other thing I do want to touch on, um, because it, you know, was, was so interesting to me, not obvious coming in is I talked about the debt just now in the cost of capital, but also talking about the equity <clears throat> and the opportunities for raising equity. Um, a lot of people have ideas in the market. We actually have the properties to execute them on. So, you know, build for rent, single family homes for rent. Um, people are raising a ton of money around this strategy and then they have to go look for deals. Well, we're sitting on 20 deals that we could execute today and probably have another pipeline of 20 to 30 behind that. Um, that's, that's unique. Um, it, it just is, right? Very few people have those sort of opportunities to put out money today. Um, so from an equity perspective, you know, it's really interesting. We're, you know, we are from a from a GNA and and just sort of general expense perspective. Um, I think we're doing a really good job of streamlining that. As you know, we've you know shut down the uh, our ancillary offices and we've streamlined our operating team, um, and we're absolutely hiring in the disciplines that we need, uh, leasing, capital markets, um, things like that. But when it comes to you know our cost structure, obviously trying to be um, more efficient with that. Um, but in terms of, of of cash flow, I feel like there's a very clear path to being you know cash flow positive, except that we're using all cash for our investments. And I think that's really what people that's not how real estate is done, right? It just isn't done. So the most important thing from from my perspective is how do you utilize the value of the land to uh, to have imputed equity in deals, right? And you don't have to come up with cash. But there's so much debt and so much equity available on the institutional side uh, for these deals that we're finding we can maintain the large majority of the ownership of these deals just based on the markup of the land value and the amount of debt and equity that we're able to raise around, around the execution, which is really exciting. So we don't get diluted out, right? Because what you don't want to do is have great ideas, <clears throat> but then get diluted out of, out of you know, realizing the benefits of them. So I think from, from that perspective, um, you know, there's a tremendous opportunity and we're seeing uh, ways to leverage our capital and take advantage of, of, of the market today. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, maybe we can just stick with, you know, talking about funding the business, uh, maybe begin with talking about how you view leverage. Uh, traditional debt to EBITDA metric that we all focus on it doesn't seem all that relevant at the moment uh, for a company that has so many developments, so much work in process. So how, how do you view leverage? No, it's a great question. I, listen, we're all nav all day long, right? I mean, if you're looking for cash flow today, like we're, we're not your girls. Like this is not this is not where you should be investing. Um, you know, but we have we do have tremendous opportunities, and I think it's really about a loan to value. And if you think about, um, you know, first year has been fantastic, and I, I think there's lots of opportunities. And the debt is two years away, and I think we have a lot of opportunities. I don't worry about a refinance, but if you said to me, okay, gun to your head, like you know, what are some of the ways you could refinance and lower your cost of capital? I think it's at the property level all day long, to be honest, because there's just the, the, the cost of capital is so, so, so low for the product types that we've identified and the markets are so flush with money. And so when I think about that, I think about a, a low LTV today on book value, right? That's, that has zero consideration. Like if you're, if you're in the 50s on LTV of book value today without any consideration for the value creation, which is massive. And by the way, it's not theoretical. Right, like we're in for permits, we, we have entitlements ready to go. I mean, Aventura, that market could not be hotter. Um, you know, Boca is an amazing opportunity for us. Dallas, you think about what we're doing in Dallas and the housing. I mean, Texas is in Florida, is such a big winner. We have so much in Florida. Texas is a massive winner. We have so much in Texas. Life sciences is white hot. And we have between UTC and, and uh, Southern San Francisco and San Bruno. And by the way, that's, that's just the beginning. That's just the most obvious ones, right? Those are like the most massive, most obvious ones. Um, so, you know, it's really exciting for us to think about like the opportunity to, you know, use debt creatively to really leverage the value of our land and own a very big piece of really exciting, massive, incredibly valuable developments. Yeah. How should we think about the pace of spend for development over the next few years? You know, it's, it's a difficult... The way that the company was founded was, you know, there was give or take on a gross basis, $210 million of Sears revenue just flowing in right when the company was founded. And that gave people the time and um, 
really the luxury of time of, you know, making plans, thinking about it. And then when they had a plan that they thought was good and, and you know, shovel ready, they would terminate Sears and start with the plan. Well, that spigot didn't, didn't come to a trickle. I mean, it, it trickled a little bit when, um, when Sears downsized, but then it came to a screeching halt. And so we do have a situation other than the multi-tenant retail, which really is about backfilling, you know, the Sears downsize boxes more or less, or they're just, you know, really good retail locations and we have terminated the lease and we chopped it up um, into, into other retail tenants. It, it really is everything starts at once. We have a little bit of, it would be nice if we could stage it better in terms of having, you know, some cash flow and then waiting and having other projects. Um, that said, I think if you look at the short term, obviously grocery anchor, triple net and the um, multi-tenant retail are, are probably in the next, you know, six, 12, 18 months. And you see there's a lot of SNO income that um, is coming online. And I, I think that's, that's pretty exciting. Um, it's really about just delivery because when you're splitting boxes, obviously there was a, a construction delay, right? The world shut down. Um, so I think there's like, that's really in sort of the near term. Then in the middle term, I mean, we do have some multifamily being delivered. I think the multifamily piece is sort of the next thing to hit. It's, it's quick to build. It's just a matter of getting through entitlements. And in fairness, there were some plans where even sometimes you have to slow down to speed up and even delaying and, and changing the site plan, the execution, even on a time effective basis is so much more profitable. Um, and we're able to create so much more value that there's some where we are in for some site plan modifications now, which we actually think are net net extremely accretive. Um, and then I would say like the longest are, you know, things like the life sciences, right? So you look at something like UTC, the density there is massive, right? Um, Dallas, similar. Uh, also, we're not, we're not doing spec office. Um, there were a lot of plans with spec office. I, I don't think that's the business we should be in. I don't think that's the business our investors want us to be in. Um, you know, I think that especially suburban spec office, um, you know, you look at a market like UTC, UTC is a super prime class A office slash life science, you know, market. And I think you can go either way there. And we are looking at it again, no pride of authorship, totally agnostic. It's all, it's all value creation, return driven, um, what we're going to build there. But what I would say is, um, you know, we, we've taken a lot of the spec office out of the plan. And I think as multifamily has, the demand for multifamily is so exciting. Uh, we've really tried to, to densify further in multifamily and really create more efficient buildings where, you know, if you're going to build it, don't build it in a phase two, right? Like build a really efficient community. Dallas is a great example of that. We think there's an opportunity in Dallas to build, you know, 500 more units easily above and beyond the original, the original plan, um, plus grocery, plus out parcels. I mean, it's a really, you know, looking at sites like that where you can really densify and densify into, uh, you know, if you will, the darlings of, of real estate today um, in terms of, you know, what, where, what's attracting financing uh, both on the equity and debt sides. Great. Um, I do want to hit on the operations and tenant demand in a second, but we do have a few uh, relevant uh, to this topic questions from the audience. Uh, let's begin with uh, the first one here. Uh, do you have a timetable on when you'll be, uh, I guess, completing the projects at Redmond, Valley View, and Hicksville? Probably a, a little bit of a range here, but I don't know where you're, where you're at on your plans there. Yeah, so I would say, um, you know, Redmond, we've actually, that is, that is a plan that we have tweaked. Um, we think that there's, you know, a tremendous residential opportunity there um, above and beyond the residential that's been slated. Um, so we're working with the city right now to see um, how we could potentially intensify that um, with residential. We think that's, that's really um, the right play there. Um, I think the timeline is similar because the entitlements are similar. I just think the end product is going to be is going to be different um, in terms of Hicksville. I think there's, you know, we have a, a one of the best grocers in the world you can imagine uh, coming into Hicksville as well as a tremendous opportunity to add a lot of uh, out parcels. Um, we have modified our residential plan. I mean, listen, the market talks to you and tells you what you need to build, um, but also municipalities. And when they tell you what they're going to let you do, you have to listen. Um, and I, you know, we did get caught from a timing perspective in the sense that while we were trying to get our plan entitled, the, the town actually entitled themselves a thousand units by the train station, which really checked the box for them on their transit oriented uh, developments. And so there really is no appetite for a multifamily product in Hicks Hill um, for the town. And I think that there are other plans that we can execute, um, which were, you know, we will go public with shortly, um, that I think, I, I think are incredibly valuable um, from our calculations were actually more profitable than the original plan uh, and can be executed more quickly. So um, I, I think that's really the, the key is, is um, you know, looking at something like Dallas is, is very similar. We have um, a grocer that we're looking to build with residential on top. We have a site plan with the city. We're looking for some modifications, like I said, because we think there are some sites that were office um, and that I think we can, you know, obviously do a built to suit office. And we are talking to uh, some, you know, super high credit uh, tech tenants about doing um, some built to suit space there. Um, but there's also a densification of the residential and that's the, that's the play we're focused on now. I, I can't, I, you know, listen, in certain cases, you have something like the Ivy Mall. I, I don't own it. Right? I don't have control over it. I think the market's fantastic, but we have to look at our sites as really self-sustaining. 
Um, and they're big enough. I mean, Dallas is big enough that, you know, this, this could be its own master plan development and will be its own master plan development without them all. They figure it out. Terrific. That's great. It only helps our value. And eventually they will. But what I'm not going to do is sit and wait and not control my own destiny in, you know, a piece of land that is as valuable and well-located and as robust of a market as, as Dallas is. Got it. And one more from the audience uh, question is re regarding the disposition program. Will it be more aggressive than the prior, uh, the management team had going? And then um, with the overall realization of value between construction spend be a little bit slower than previously. Okay. So, take, so dispositions, it, it, it's going to look like we're selling more stuff because this is it. So before we would just sell things like one off as opposed to looking at the whole portfolio and saying, okay, this is the stuff that we don't want to own, right? This is the stuff where we don't add unique value to owning this, right? Or it's just not our best use of our capital. We, we're not going to execute the best on this. We rather double down on our best projects. So, you know, like that, that it's going to look like a lot, but this is it. This is what I'm selling. And then like, it's just the stuff I don't want to own. So we're just, we're just more intentional, I would say about it. Um, and then in terms of, um, sorry, the second, the follow-up question was, was the, the, the realization of value will just take a little bit longer than previously anticipated. I think you may have already touched upon it. In a some little cases, bit yes. About. In some cases, absolutely not. I mean, that, that's the thing is there are a lot of places where the plans that we were trying to entitle were just not um, what the realistic in terms of the city and you really have to wait. I mean, time is money, uh, you know, obviously everyone knows that. Um, and, you know, getting entitlements are not free. So, you know, there's a lot of money being spent in consultants and by the way, our own time, right? Like there's a lot of, you know, this this team needs to execute. There's a laser like focus on execution. We have split the whole company. Now we have split the portfolio into six sub portfolios based on execution. We've actually split the company into, into interdisciplinary teams to execute. So they know that if there's a plan that, that has a low probability of execution, move on, let's make sure we're, there's something just as profitable that's more realistic, it's actually gonna be better for the company and shareholders. Most and now maybe we can look at the demand. Um, you obviously, you scrubbed the SNO, uh, uh, the SNOs, uh, got rid of some leases that were probably uh, not the best for you. And I, I guess what retailers are you now focused on and where you've seen the highest demand? Yeah, so listen, I think COVID has taught us a lot and I think our centers are the big winners coming out of COVID. Um, listen, I think our collections demonstrate that, right? Like we have 100% compliance with every rent deferral program that we put together, right? So all of our tenants paid for their rent uh, deferrals. Um, we're not, we have 97% collections rates. Our rates were in the 90s all the way through the pandemic. So, it, you know, buy in store, buy online, pick up in store, curbside pickup, um, the opportunity for outdoor dining, right? So I think we, we are the big winners. Um, value, obviously was a huge winner. So if you look at our tenancy, um, you know, the value players are, are a big portion of, of our tenancy. You know, people like Dick Sporting Goods. I think, I think people being outside, exercising in their homes, um, you know, playing sports and sports are, have all returned with incredible enthusiasm. Um, you know, I think they've been the big winners of COVID. Um, and, you know, grocery is, is an obvious one. Um, you know, the grocery, grocers know based on, um, you know, the ordering online and so much shipping. Um, grocers know where they have holes in the market and they know where the demand is. And so what's been, if there's such a transparency from the retail side, because there was so much online shopping and there was so much shipping that, you know, you take someone like, you know, a Whole Foods or a Walmart, you know, Amazon knows where they're sending all this stuff, right? They knew where the density was. So now they want to place grocers where they know they were shipping stuff, right? Walmart is the same. Um, Target, you know, all of these companies. So it's been, that part of it's been really interesting. Um, the other part uh, are the triple net out parcels, right? So we have you know, not only do they offer an opportunity for outdoor dining, but curbside pickup and drive throughs right? drive throughs were the massive, massive, massive winner. Um, and it used to be a nice to have, now it's a have to have. Um, and very, it's very hard to accommodate, right? I mean, you need a lot of stays in terms of queuing and traffic and everything else, um, you know, which right now we uniquely can accommodate uh, when you look at, you know, the mall or other uh, other boxes that are vacant and you look at their parking lots and ours looks like a fan, right? It's like this, it's this box in this massive lot. And then you look at everyone else's and it's like this. And they just can't accommodate it. Um, we're so overparked. Uh, we have so much space. So it's really exciting. Those are great opportunities. The other thing I would say um, is people have asked us a lot about last mile and logistics. You know, one of the, the best parts about being well located is it's usually not your highest and best use to just have like a bunch of trucks and loading docks. Um, we have about three locations where we think that, you know, industrial or logistics is like is the highest and best use. And those are terrific markets. Um, one of them is in, you know, South Florida, where the, the rents for, for um, industrial are super high. Obviously, cap rates are super tight, and there's so much money flowing into it. But separate and apart, you know, from a last mile perspective, really what, what, what the pandemic did was the store became last mile. And retailers realized that when they couldn't open new, new locations, they couldn't, you know, it's not like you could just put up a, um, a, a, a you know, some industrial uh, logistics center, or last mile distribution center in two seconds, especially when the whole world was, was shut down, um, they, they got super creative about using their stores. 
and between the data that they have from online shopping and the repurposing of their stores and using merchandise um, within stores and between stores to fulfill last mile um, and all the, you know, really the online, like the online purchases and curbside pickups, they're looking at stores totally differently. And we're seeing tremendous demand for leasing now. Um, and tenants are really focused. Um, they're super focused and they want to deal because they know that you know they want to be in that location and they're very specific and they're and they want to close and and we're we're happy to be be the recipients. Of that. Um, can you clarify? I believe all your centers are open air or have open air access. So can you clarify that point? And then maybe you can talk about pricing power. Who has the negotiating power between you and the landlord right now? Are you and the sure. retailer? Sorry, you are the landlord. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so we have zero enclosed malls. Um, we are attached to, but we don't have any indoor space, which has been a tremendous winner. Um, and there are a lot of people that actually are popping out of the mall. Um, that are interested in our location. So that's really exciting. In terms of um, in terms of who has the balance of power, like I said, I think that um, they're not, the value players that are very well suited for our portfolio um, are expanding. Uh, and they're, like I said, they're very specific on the locations and they want to make deals and they're very, they, they want to show that they're growing and they want to grow the markets they care about. Um, I think part of our, the best part of our multi-tenant portfolio is we really don't have any small shops. So the small shop, the small shops that we have really are out parcels, which like then fall into the triple net bucket, which, you know, credit, um, super tight cap rates, tons of demand for them. And we have a really robust portfolio of them. Um, so I think by not having the small shops, um, you know, th that's where there's not as much leasing velocity because of so many, unfortunately, small businesses were so destroyed um, by COVID. So um, I think really the balance of power uh, from a, even from pre-pandemic to now, I think is, is, is more equalized, um, which is really, which is really exciting. Um, I think people also want to take advantage of the stimulus money and people's, you know, demand to get out there and shop and eat and do all these all these things again. Um, and so, from from an execution perspective, the, the timelines are definitely shorter than they had been. You know, there's not sort of the, you know, window shopping um, that there was two years ago. Got it. Well, I'm seeing no further questions from the audience, so uh, so yeah, I think I can uh, turn it over to you if you have any closing remarks, or we can end it here. No, I, I listen. I think I think that you know, looking at this at this company as all the portfolios that we have um, and the value of those sub portfolios, and also the portfolio premium on those types of properties, um, I think is really the way to look at it. And like I said, it's a nav story all day long. It's a value creation story all day long. Uh, and listen, I, I don't think having come from the other side of being an outsider looking in, trying to understand the value, we have not historically done a good job of demystifying a complicated company. Uh, for the investors. And I just, you know, as you can see from the deck we put out from, you know, this sort of, um, you know, these interviews and, and, and discussions, you know, we are looking to, to undo that and to demystify uh, the company, because I think it's really an understanding the component parts that you understand the value. Well, Andrea and Amanda, thank you both. I look forward to seeing you later.